So I have a three-year-old. <laughs> like how people laugh already. <laughs> you know where this is going. And she's, my daughter Ruth is at such a fun age where she actually has interests now. Like she loves ballet. She loves to use her imagination. We can play and do voices and invent silly characters and it's amazing. But there's also some trying things going on right now. And she is in the stage of relentlessly asking questions. A day and night, night and day, questions arise. Left and right, all over the place, questions all over the place. And so she's asking to anything. She goes, why, Dada? What? How? What about? Why does this happen? Why? Why? And I love that. But as you know, it can get exhausting. And I was talking to a mom between services, and she says, I actually get it from two kids, one in each ear, just why, 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 why? And who here uh, in the theater, or uh, in the room here, up in the theater watching online, who here has a three-year-old or toddler that asks a lot of questions? Do you find it to be trying? Why? No, I'm just kidding. That's, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, sorry. And so what I realized is that as my daughter asked me so many questions, it has really revealed how little I know about the world. <laughs> To be honest with you, my daughter asked my wife recently, Mama, how does the sunset work? Do you guys know how a sunset works? No, literally, I'm asking. I need to report back to my question queen. <laughs> it's just crazy. She asks all these questions. On the way here, apparently, my wife was telling me, she goes, Mama, what's philosophy? This child is three. She's asking about philosophy. What kind of Aristotle am I raising? But here's what I love about her questions. They make me slow down and think more deeply through things and operate with no assumption of prior knowledge. And as we get into our subject and our topic today, we're, we're going to bring up something, we're going to address something that's one of the most enigmatic and least tangible tops, topics and subjects in the entirety of Scripture. We're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit. And a lot of people have a lot of questions. Who? What? Why? How? Who? Who? About the Holy Spirit. And so like with my daughter, Ruth, I have learned this recently. She's discipled me in this. I actually want to slow down. I want to think deeply through what we're going to talk about. I don't want to assume you have any prior knowledge. And I want to endeavor to address your question clearly and holistically. And so what we're going to do here in a little bit is I'm going to kind of do a, a Bible run through where I kind of paint the picture and show you throughout the entirety of the scriptures who the Holy Spirit is, what the Holy Spirit does, and then that will lead us into week two of our series. As we've been in this series, Lord Send Revival. And this series, like I told you, is, is designed around a design pattern of three. It's three words, Lord Send Revival. It's three weeks, last week, this week, and next week. And <clears throat> we're looking at revival, the topic of revival, as we prepare for our hunger revival that we've talked about. Uh, we're, we're looking at it from three different perspectives. We're analyzing revival from three different perspectives. A biblical perspective, a historical perspective, and the perspective of you and I and how that impacts us today and how we can live lives of revival. <clears throat> and in this, we, we unapologetically are asking, Lord, send revival. We want to see what is spiritually dead be brought to life, what is spiritually lost be found. We want to see the church rejuvenated and revitalized and reinvigorated. So we're praying, Lord, send revival. And then we're also looking at three different key components of any revival. And they don't have to necessarily be in this order. But we talked about how you see some kind of in, in revival, you see some kind of repentance, and then an outpouring of the Spirit, and then that leads to profound change in the world. And so last week, we opened up talking about part one, repentance. And then this week, we're going to get into part two, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And remember, the order is not set. It can go in any particular order. Well, the first two can go in any particular order. So let me give you a quick Bible run through and show you kind of how the Holy Spirit is woven throughout the beautiful continuity and cogency of the Lord's word. And let's start with not even Genesis, before Genesis, pre-creation. And we know that before anything was created, anything made that was made, we know that God existed and that God is a triune God. He's a trinity, a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons and one God. One God and three, here it, persons with one will, one purpose, and one unity. All working together in the self-loving, self-giving, joyous community of oneness. And I know, I know, I know, some of you are like, that defies human logic and doesn't make a lot of human sense. 
I think that's actually a good apologetic for the Bible. I think that actually proves the truthfulness of the Bible because I could make up a religion based on our finite understanding of the world that would appeal to a finite understanding of the world. I think there's something profound about a God who is so ineffable and is so transcendent that he in his kindness has actually had to reveal his character and nature to us so that we could try to get our heads around it. But what I need you to lock in is that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one. And all three are present before creation and in creation. In fact, in Genesis 1, we read that the Spirit, the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the dark, chaotic waters and helped bring creation to life. Well, then you flip and rifle a couple pages further in the Bible, especially the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah, and you get to this account, this narrative historical account of this group of people known as the people of Israel. And the Lord delivers this people of Israel from their enslavement in Egypt, and he enters, as a nation, he enters into this covenant relationship, this binding relationship with them. And in this relationship, the Lord calls these people to love the Lord and to love their neighbor, to, be, to obey and be faithful to the Lord and to, li- to walk out the Lord's words, ways, and worship to all the people and all the nations around them. And in this way, bless all peoples of the earth and draw all peoples of the earth to the one true living God. This is part of the covenant agreement and it was chef's kiss beautiful. And then the Lord puts Israel on this trajectory to go to this promised land he's prepared to them, for them so that they can live as this type of people in this type of nation. <clears throat> well, there's joy in the journey to the land until there's not. <laughs> and as soon <laughs> as this guy Moses is leading the Israelites to the promised land, as they're going through the wilderness, the people begin grumbling and they ask a lot of questions, kind of like my daughter Ruth. When are we going to get there? What time? Where's the food? Why is the food this way? When? What? Why? How? When? Why? What? And so Moses is just, Oy. And then the people start getting mad at Moses and wanting to turn on him. And so <laughs> it's... He's so frustrated. You know when you're taking a road trip with the kids in the back and they're just complaining the whole time and you're like, I will turn this car around right now. Moses has that kind of energy. And he gets so fatigued. He just, oy vey, I can't even. And so the Lord appoints for Moses 72 elders to help hold him up and bolster him and encourage him. And in this really auspicious, interesting passage in Numbers 11, we hear that these 72, we read that 72 elders Get this outpouring and filling of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity before creation. They get this outpouring and filling of the Holy Spirit, and they begin to prophesy. Now, when you hear prophesy, you think like, mm, uh, future prediction, I'm going to prophesy something and predict uh, the Falcons are going to win the Super Bowl. First of all, that's false teaching, Okay. <laughs> That's, that's heretical. That's not going to happen. Sorry. <laughs> it didn't break your heart. But that's not really what prophecy is. Prophecy is, and, 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 and see the verbiage here, it's speaking out the Lord's message. It's speaking out the Lord's message and his truth to the Lord's people. And that's what these, these 72 elders start to do. Well, Moses' right-hand man, his young pup, protege, Joshua sees this, and he like cartoon runs, skidly, 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 and he goes, whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. Oh, no, 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 you got to stop that. Oh, only Moses is supposed to do that. And Moses, in this really predictive moment, this prophetic moment, he goes, whoa, 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 hold on, young pup. Moses says this. He says, are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Notice the word all. Put his spirit on all people. Moses, it's almost as if he has this vision down the road of the Lord one day pouring out his spirit on all people. And so Israel continues to progress towards the land. The people continue to ask questions. Why, where, why, when, where's the food, why? And so they finally get to the precipice. Joshua takes over. He's getting ready to kick down the door of the promised land. And the Lord gives Joshua this special outpouring and filling of the Holy Spirit. So that Joshua can not only speak out the Lord's message to the Lord's people, but also live out the Lord's way among the people and accomplish the Lord's good plans, purposes, and promises in doing that. And so he, and, and he's able to do that. The Lord fills him. There's an outpouring and a filling that gives him, hear the word, hear the word, hear the word, the power to do this. Something similar happens later on with this leader named Gideon and with Samson, who you've probably heard of. But this, this outpouring and this feeling of the Spirit at this time on the precipice of the land and right when they get into the land and they're setting themselves up, hear it. It's a temporary feeling of the Holy Spirit. It's kind of just like going into berserker mode or it's kind of like me 
after three cups of coffee, where I feel like I can either take over the world or should consult a cardiologist, like that kind. Or like your kid with a sugar rush where they get shark eyes dilated. Ah, it's kind of that temporary feeling. <laughs> you get that. <laughs> it's that temporary feeling. But one day, there will be an outpouring on all people. And so that takes us into the land. And Israel gets established in the land and it doesn't take too long before they break the covenant with the Lord. And they fail to love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. They fail to love their neighbors as themselves. They fail to obey and be faithful to the Lord and walk out the Lord's words, ways, and worship to the neighbors around them and to bless them in order to draw them to the Lord. And they actually go rogue and go wayward and pursue their own passions and proclivities and purposes and desires. And they, they wander far from the Lord. And that's where a group of people known as the prophets arise. And the prophets try to call the people back. And they call for them to repent. And if you were here last week, you know, don't let me hang it. Don't let me hang it. The Hebrew word for repent or return is what? Shoot. Shoot. Let me hear it one more time. What is it? Yeah, you got it, shuv. And so he calls them to realize, well, how far they've come to really turn, confess their sins, and then to return to the Lord. Uh, the, the people like do this and then they don't. And then they do this and then they don't. And then this particular prophet, Ezekiel, makes this really astute, uh, really astute observation and identification. It's almost like he's a good cardiologist. And it's like he looks closely at the people and he goes, huh. I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. The problem is your heart. That's the issue. I could tell you all the, world, the words in the world and do all this stuff. I could speak out the Lord's truth as I'm filled with the Spirit and live out the Lord's way as I'm filled with the Spirit as a prophet. But I think the issue is you in your heart. You have a corrupt heart that just irrevocably does what's right in your own eyes, but is evil in the eyes of the Lord. That's the issue. But then... Ezekiel prophetically starts to see a day when the Lord will do a new thing, where he will draw people from all nations, remember that, all nations to himself, and will give them a new heart and a new mind, a new heart and a new mind, and then draw them into a new and renewed covenant with this renewed heart, with this renewed mind, so that they, the people might actually love the Lord God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love their neighbor as themselves, that they might actually obey and be faithful to the Lord and walk out his words, his ways, and his worship among the people to bless them and draw them in. This is, and Ezekiel's like, this is going to happen. But the way it's going to happen, he predicts, hear this, Ezekiel predicts, then this guy Joel, another prophet predicts, and another prophet, Isaiah, predicts. They predict and foresee and prophesy an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that would bring all of this about, that would change people's hearts and minds and bring them into that new covenant and new community. And this is the hope that lingered for 400 years heading in to the New Testament. Then, we pick up in the New Testament, and in the four, first four historical narrative accounts of the life and ministry of Jesus, we see that Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, present before creation, we see God become flesh and make his dwelling among us. We see Jesus move towards us. We see God move towards us in the person of Jesus, born of a virgin, he enters into human existence. Uh, Paul describes it as, in Jesus, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell Jesus is, is God incarnated, embodied, dwelling among people. And in the life and in the ministry of Jesus, Jesus shows us what the Lord is like. And in the ministry of Jesus, I need you to see these themes. Jesus gathers followers around him and, and fo followers flock to Jesus. But, 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 these are diverse and sometimes disparate groups of people. I, I preached on this a couple weeks ago. Jesus' 12 disciples had every reason to hate each other. They were really different. They had political differences and religious differences and personality differences. Jesus called people from all over the land to himself, people from different cities with different allegiances, even Roman people. So there were some Romans that were attracted to the way of Jesus. And in fact, this hated people group, the Samaritans, they became followers of Jesus. And they started following Jesus. And there was this beautiful unity in that. People from all over the nations and from different ethnicities and tribes and political persuasions and personalities, they all gathered together and were unified around the teaching and ministry of Jesus. Though some hated. 
And what Jesus did is he showed people how to speak out the message of Jesus and live out the way of Jesus. I need you to see that today. To speak out the message of Jesus and live out the way of Jesus. And as he traveled around teaching them how to do that, people's lives were changed and there was abundant, hear it, joy. There was abundant joy in this as people were changed. But then... Jesus told his followers, his 12 disciples, he said, hey, here's the thing. I'm not going to be here forever because Jesus knew he was going to eventually ascend to the right hand of God the Father. We'll talk about that in a second. But he knew he wasn't always going to be here. And he said, here's the thing. I'm going to send you a helper. I'm going to essentially send you an outpouring and a filling of the Holy Spirit who will lead you and who will guide you until I return. And it's funny because like in the Gospel of John, Jesus tells them like again and again and again, and they kind of just don't hear it. Kind of like when you tell your kids something 200 times before lunch and they still don't hear it. That's kind of how Jesus is with this. And then as you continue reading in the Gospels, Jesus goes on to fulfill all the Lord's good plans, purposes, and promises from the Old Testament. He, becomes the, he proves that he is the Messiah, the suffering servant, the one who died on a cross to take on all sin for all time, for whosoever should turn and return to Jesus and accept his free gift of grace. Jesus took the place in the punishment of sin. But then Jesus didn't stay dead. Jesus was tragically buried and then triumphantly raised again. And before he ascended to the right hand of God the Father, which he told his disciples he was going to, he tells the disciples this. uh, And we read this from what he, he tells them. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. Again, Jesus is like, remember I said it like 200 times before lunch. For John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so Jesus says, stay here in Jerusalem, and he predicts this outpouring and filling of the Holy Spirit that was predicted all throughout the Old Testament. So then Jesus says, and here's the thing, here's what's going to happen on the other side of this. He says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And the word for power here in Greek, this is the one Greek word I want to teach you today. The word for power here is dunamis. So you guys try that on. Dunamis. And it means power, strength, ability, or energy. You can use that at the gym this week. Dunamis. You already know. And so Jesus ascends to the right hand of God the Father, where he remains today as we await his return. And the disciples, they just kind of wait around in Jerusalem. They're like, we're supposed to wait, but... Uh, what's going on? What's happening? Something about outpouring in the spirit, helper, something? I don't know. And they prepare themselves for this Old Testament feast that they still observed called Shavuot, but you probably know it as Pentecost. And so they gather in the temple and hear it. Jewish people from all over the nations converge and gather. There's this unity, unity, unity of the Jewish people. They gather together from all nations and they're in the temple and they begin this prelude of prayer and preaching the word and worship. This is what you did at Shavuot or Pentecost. And if you were here last week, you know that any revival has the inklings and stirrings of a prelude of prayer and preaching the word. And it's almost like an orchestra tuning up before the production. That like swell and the ground starts to shake with a stirring of revival. And then as you read what happens next, you read that there is an outpouring, a profound outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon this event. It says in the text that there was a roar and the sound of a mighty rushing wind that fills the place. And the people are, there's this outpouring of the Spirit and the people there are filled with the Holy Spirit. And in this, there's this incredible unity as they're all able to uh, 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 all of a sudden speak and communicate with one another and they understand each other. There's this beautiful unity in that. And then there's this, this dunamis, this power in it. That, and, and, and people see almost like the likeness of a fire above one another's head. And that's what inspired our artwork for this series. And you see that there's this effusive and just elated joy just permeating this event. And what's so cool about this outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the filling of these people is that it's exactly what Moses predicted and knew would happen. It's exactly what Ezekiel talked about, what Joel talked about, what Isaiah talked about, and what Jesus promised. It all comes to fruition and fulfillment. But then, this isn't a one-off event. Because the disciples are launched out. This becomes a catalytic event. You'll see this with revivals. It it becomes a catalytic event 
that sends the disciples out. And they start living out what Jesus said. They start, they're filled with power from the Holy Spirit and they become witnesses to Jesus in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And as the disciples go out, here's what's beautiful and we're gonna start talking about these themes. They do so together and they draw all people from all nations together, which is beautiful. And there's this beautiful unity in that. Say unity. But then you see that they're operating in this promised dunamis or power. Say power. And it's not just, yes, it's powers of like signs and there's healing. But dude, just the power to speak out the message of Jesus and to live out the way of Jesus. They start to proclaim the gospel of Jesus and they live it out in these communities. And it starts to change the world. And when they go from town to town and city to city, you know what the response is? Profound change and great joy. And in fact, they make these, (laughs) the Holy Spirit fills these followers as they come to Jesus and they are given a new heart and a new mind. And it's like they enter into this new covenant that the Lord had foretold and promised, that they might actually love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, that they might actually love their neighbor as themselves, that they may actually faithfully follow the Lord and be obedient to him and walk out his ways, his worship, and his words amongst their neighbors, to bless all people and draw people to the Lord. We see the full culmination of this in the book of Acts, and it changes the world. And what happens here, this is what I love, this is what I love. This also wasn't a one-time event because the shockwave and the reverberations of of revival can still be felt today, throughout church history and today. Because the Lord said, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not stand against it and they have not. And from Pentecost on, revival has continued and we see it today and we pray for more of it. And so, let me tell you a little bit about church history. Let me regale you with church history. Let me tell you about the businessmen's revival of New York City in 1857. There's this man named Jeremiah Lamphere. Jeremiah Lamphere. We got a picture of him. Watch out, ladies. Hey, now. He looks like Abraham Lincoln's more attractive younger brother. And he looked around the city. He's like, oh, this is terrible. I don't know what a New York accent sounded like that back then. Sorry. Uh, (laughs) So what are you going to do? He looks around New York City, and he sees that it's a city awash with crime and just fettered with corruption or festering with corruption and fettered with sin and evil and wickedness. And there's segregation and division. And in the country at the time, there was this economic collapse. And the Civil War was on the brink of breaking out. And again, people were segregated in society. And oh, there was deep division. And he said, that's not okay. And so he started having these kind of power hour lunch prayer times that started out with five people. Woo! Lord send revival. But after one year, turned into 10,000 people people meeting every day for lunch to repent and to begin this prelude of prayer and preaching the word. And the ground started shaking with the inklings of revival. And on the other side of this, we know from historical accounts that there was a profound outpouring of the Holy Spirit and everything changes. And one of the things that was most notable to people is that this didn't just a businessman's revival. It actually brought unity to all the business classes from very well-to-do businessmen to middle class to lower class, even to to the poor. It actually kicked out to people of different political persuasions. Uh, Again, a deeply segregated society. People were worshiping together. Men and women oftentimes did not serve together, worship together, or work together. And we see there was this unity. Everyone came together to worship, to repent, and experience this outpouring of the Spirit. And there was unity. Say unity. Unity. But then, in the the light of this outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the people are imbued and they're filled with this dunamis, this power to go out and to do the thing that Jesus called them to do. They're, They're imbued with this power to speak out the message of Jesus and then to live out the way of Jesus. And because they do this, hear this, hear this number. In the time of this revival, one million people become followers of Jesus. Lord, send revival. One million people. I like how we clap. You you should get excited. I like how we clap like it just happened yesterday. That's dope. I like that. I like that. I like that. 
But it's because of this dunamis that they were granted. And this led to profound change in the city. Crime plummeted in the city. Police and, and, and uh, city council were, were shocked. There's reports that hundreds of women captured in prostitution were freed and they were free to faithfully follow Jesus. The city was changed. And this was an occasion for great joy. And joy broke out throughout the city. Say joy. joy. And so we see this theme of unity and of power and of joy in this revival. Let me also tell you about the Azusa Street Revival of 1906. And it was started by this man named William Joseph Seymour. And William Joseph Seymour grew up in the fever pitch time of Jim Crow laws and lived under the oppressive yoke thereof. And William Seymour, <clears throat> William Joseph Seymour had this burden for revival. And so he decided he, he wanted to become a pastor. And so he knew there was a seminary he wanted to go to in Topeka, Kansas. First Service laughs like really loud at that. I don't know why First Service hated Topeka, Kansas. But he wanted to go to Topeka, Kansas. You know, Kansas, where you can watch your dog run away for three days. <laughs> Still going, honey. Still going. But here's the thing. Because it was such a deeply segregated society... He had to sit, he could not sit in the, cl the classroom for the seminary. He had to sit outside with a window open to listen to the lecture in rain or shine. And instead of getting bitter about it, some, the Holy Spirit was stirring something in him. And he, and he had a bigger vision. And he ended up moving to Los Angeles, California, or the L.A. area. And he started meeting with people in this small home. And he started this prelude of prayer and preaching the word. And the Lord started moving and the house filled up. And they had to go get this bigger building on Azusa Street in L.A. And the Lord started doing some profound things. And the ground started shaking with the rumblings of revival. And on the other side of this repentance, there's this profound outpouring of the spirit and it starts drawing all people from the city together and I mean all people from the city together and in fact a non-Christian secular journalist starts writing they're still using typewriters back then and he starts writing about like revival breaks out wow gotta come see I don't know that's is that the voice in the early 1900s I don't know and so that okay Kim were you there no just kidding uh so, and so they're writing and they go, this is incredible. It's uh, white people and black people are worshiping together like it's not a big deal. Native American people and Latin people are worshiping together like it's not a big deal. People who are American citizens and people who had just come to this country are worshiping together like there's no big deal. And they're just singing in one voice and there's this beautiful unity that takes place. Say unity. But then, whoo, 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 there's also on the other side of this outpouring of the Holy Spirit, there's this dunamis that the people are granted. And they get sent out from this building on Azusa Street, and they start proclaiming the gospel. And they speak out the message of Jesus, and they start to live out the way of Jesus in a compelling and winsome way that draws even more people to this revival. And what we see on the other side is people are sent out into the community, yeah, and then thousands and thousands and thousands of people become faithful followers of Jesus, but they are sent all over the world. And in fact, this event is known as the Azusa Street Pentecost. And it actually launched the Pentecostal denomination, if you're familiar with it, which still impacts the world today. Those are the reverberations of revival. Let me tell you, actually before I tell you that, let's hit one more theme. There was all these historical accounts of the joy, the palpable, effusive joy in the city as this happened. And so on the other side of this dunamis power, we see this joy. So say power, and then joy. Yeah, so now we see the same thing lastly in the Korean revival of 1907. And I, I, I love this. Okay, so two missionaries go to Korea and their names, I'm not making this up, their names are R.A. Hardy and M.C. White. Someone convinced me that's not a hip-hop crew. Like, go ahead and convince me that's not a hip-hop clique. And so they begin to labor for the people of, in prayer for the people of Korea. And in fact, they actually reach out to missionaries and ministry and ministers and they call them to repentance. And they have these prayer gatherings that create this prelude of prayer and preaching the word. And people start repenting of sins and confessing sins. And the ground begins to shake and tremble with the murmurings of revival. And then on the other side of this, there is a profound outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And... Everyone, this is so beautiful. This one minister 
And Graham Lee says that he starts just goading the people and exhorting them to pray for revival and pray for revival. And 1,500 people in one place start praying out loud at one time. And Graham describes it, Graham Lee describes it this way. He said it was like a mighty roaring of wind. He says it was like the sound of the ocean beating up against the very throne of God. And the ground was shaken with its revival. And then we see that as they all lift up this one voice, there's this beautiful unity in the room. Say so unity. But then there's this incredible dunamis that doesn't keep everyone in one spot. It actually sends them out. And so these, these Korean men and women, they go and they start to proclaim the gospel. They speak out the message of Jesus and they live out the way of Jesus. And because of that, thousands come to Jesus. But they do this in, in, in more arduous and difficult ways too. Because histor- historians recount that a, a bunch of Korean men and women left these gatherings and immediately started making restitutions for sins of their past. They'd go up to people's houses and say, hey, I am so sorry, I wronged you and I need to make it right. Hey, I am so sorry, I stole from you and I need to give it back and I'm gonna turn myself in. Hey, I am so sorry for that thing I said and the way I've lived, I need to make things right with you. And it, it swept through the dunamis of the the Holy Spirit, it swept all through the country and into local countries. And this is actually known even today as the Korean Pentecost. And it still has impact today because Korean churches by and large still will stand and all pray in one voice at the same time. And you see this unity and this power, say power, in this. And just so you know, the Korean church is the second largest sender of missionaries and church planters in the world today, still from 1907. Reverberations of revival. And because of this, the country and the people were filled with great joy. Say joy. And so let's talk about what that means for us today. As we bring it home, on these u- themes of unity, and of dunamis power and of joy. Here's what I wanna invite you into. Concerning unity, I wanna invite you up to the kneelers at the end of service, whether during the song or thereafter. And my invitation to you is like my daughter Ruth, ask the Lord a lot of questions. Why, who, where, what? And ask the Lord, who do I need to forgive? Who do I need to make restitution with like the the, the Koreans did? Who who, Who do I need to love that I'm not currently loving? What, what, what does that look like? Who do I not want to be around? Who am I like? Oh, those people. Oh, them. Oh, that person. And my encouragement to you is let the Lord speak to you through that and then act accordingly after. But secondly, concerning this theme of dunamis and of power, say power. I hope and I pray that the Holy Spirit imbues you with that same power today. I want you to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul in Galatians 5 says, walk by the Spirit and live by the Spirit. Living with the fruits of the Spirit. And ah, I think sometimes we can get so caught up when it talks of power in the church and they think, you know, it's like, you know, like big prophetic signs and like people falling out or it's like, I was thinking about the emperor in Star Wars who's like, power! But what about the power to love your neighbor as yourself? What about the power to love your spouse selflessly? What about the power to hold your tongue and bait your anger when you want to lash out? What about the power to be radically generous? What about the power to leave behind your addiction and your affliction to faithfully follow Jesus, to walk by the Spirit and live in the Spirit? What about the power to speak out the message of Jesus and live out the way of Jesus with your life, to draw all people to the Lord? What about that dunamis? And that's what I want to invite you into. And we have all kinds of ministries here to come along Alongside you and to support you in that. All kinds of groups, ministries you can check on our website. And lastly, let's talk about joy. Man, I would just say if you ever hear that there's an outpouring, a profound outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but there is no overflow of joy, I'm not sure it was. And in fact, I don't think revival needs to be this arduous, heavy, sad thing where we're doing Gregorian chants. Sounding like the Halo theme song. You know what I'm saying? Like, it don't need to be heavy like that. Yeah, there's repentance. Yes, but then on the other side of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, there should be great, effusive, elated joy. And so that's what I pray and invite you into. And whatever in your life is standing in the way of that joy, I would say, move it over, reprioritize, give it to the Lord so you can empty yourself and be filled with the Spirit and filled with joy. 
And so I wanna show you a video and I wanna end today by talking to you about a recent revival, the Asbury Revival. And as we do, um, I just want you to know this happened in Kentucky, not far from here, last year. And I want you to look for these themes of unity, of power, and dunamis and joy, and what happened there. A group of students didn't want to stop worshiping, and then they received the Holy Spirit in honesty and in genuineness, and um, they started sharing their testimonies, and then it didn't stop. I walked um, into the chapel and saw a bunch of students um, worshiping together very um, intimately it just everyone was crying hands were in the air it was just showcasing the love of God in so many ways that I had kind of forgotten about and um, I remember I was with a friend and we were standing in the doorway and I turned to him and I said I don't know what they have but whatever it is I want this when you think about how did this start? Um, it was nothing anybody did. It was nothing Asbury did. It was nothing that Zach Meercreeps did. It was nothing that any student did. Um, you know, I believe that it was just a, like a pure and a deep cry for more of God's spirit that these students had. And look where it's gotten us. And so we have people from all over the world now. There's been a ton of healing from church hurt and from various traumatic events. There's physical healings, there's been calls that cancer's gone, but then beyond that, something that's like I think extremely incredible is, I know this campus very well, it's small, we're less about, I guess, at a thousand students, and I know exactly which people on this campus hate each other, and those are the people that I have seen praying together, singing together, hugging, crying, like I myself have had a list of least favorite people at the school, and I have spent the week with them, and it's been like totally life-changing. I feel like the first couple of days, I've just felt so much joy. Like when I'm singing, I just can't help but like, like my mouth hurts, my jaw hurts, and just smiling ear to ear, um, and just being filled with so much joy. And I've never really liked praying out loud in front of people, but I've just felt so like bold in that, like to pray for people and allowing God to use me, just to speak through me to people. I think there's going to be commission services where we say, "Thank you for coming. I'm so glad you experienced." and encountered the Holy Spirit. Now go to your family, go to your school, go to your church, go to your community, and tell them about it and pray for them. So I wanna to end today by inviting you to stand. I wanna speak a blessing and a benediction and exhortation over you before we sing. <clears throat> so may you today May we today be one. May, be we, may we be gathered together and unified in Jesus as we pray together for revival. And may we not even just like sing as one voice, but may we live as one body in this world, as the body of Jesus. May we in this power, in this moment, experience the dunamis of the Holy Spirit, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit as we invite the Holy Spirit into our lives, into what we do, speaking out the message of Jesus and living out the way of Jesus together. And as we sing the song, inquire of the Spirit, ask those questions like my daughter, where are you sending me next? Who are you calling me to next? And what are you sending me to next? And as we continue to meet together and sing together, may you be filled with joy, effusive, elated joy, no matter what you are going through. And may we corporately cry out from the the bottom of our heart and the depths of our souls. Lord, send revival. Grace and peace to you, North Metro Church.